that you're smarter than him, better looking than him. I mean, if you want to just tell him, then now you can do that. They'll have a record of it. They'll have a record of your attendance, as we like to say. All right, if you're not already in Exodus 24, that's where we're going to be. So you can start turning over there. Exodus 24. I'm just going to apologize now. I want to talk about 12,000 things all at one time. Like I'm I, I'm not just like both barrels loaded. I have an arsenal that I just want to talk about a thousand things all at once. And so I'm like reining myself in. It was an exciting study. It ties into some of our veil stuff, just so you know. It's one of them uh, glimpses behind the scenes to that realm, unseen realm stuff that we're going to get to talk about a little bit. And then there's all just all kinds of other stuff that goes with it. So yeah, can you relate to that all, Bill, when you kind of get on one thing? And I, I know you have because we've had those conversations where it's like, all right, here goes Bill. <laughs> here goes Bill. So we're, I'm going to do my best to rein it in and stay on track, but this might become a multiple layer kind of deal or I might just get it all done in one night. We just never know where we're going to go, but... I've been excited about this one for the last few days. Before we get rolling with that, anything we need to make mention of this evening before we get started? All right, because I don't have any communication skills. Mark asked me, hey, did you get my text? And I thought he was talking about a text from four days ago that he'd sent me that morning that I'd not gotten until after. But Mark and Carol would be like, like to be recognized as members of this group. So, yes, no, I didn't get that text, but I got the one that you sent a couple of days. So he's like, yeah, I got that text. Yeah. And I was like, whatever. And I was having, did you know you could be standing with somebody and have a conversation with them and be talking about two totally different things and not even know you're talking about the two dots. So, but yes, I got the text at about 1230 on the way to old Mexico. So yes, yes, I did. All right. So Renee heard as well. And then I confirmed. So like we're having to do, and I, we all get why we're doing it, whatever, but here's the, Y'all know that's not my strong point. So now we're having to go back and like, did someone or did not some whatever. And I, did I already tell you about like what Mike Lynn told me? He goes, so you tell me we've been operating under a green card scenario? Just like he goes, I thought we were members. So you're telling me we've been worshiping on a, you know, a, 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 we, so yeah. So we got some of that kind of cleaned up, whatever, but it's the right thing. So we want to just make sure we do that. And Bill, the way you worded that Sunday, I thought was, was perfect. was perfect. So I appreciate you doing that. All right, anything else we want to make mention of before we get rolling? I remembered it because Miss Carolyn, but Bruce and Judy's address is on the foyer in the on the bulletin board in the foyer, not this one right here, but the other one. So if you'd like to send them a card or know where you can go visit, that address is listed back there if you'd be interested in that. I want to keep them uh, in our regular prayers as well. Shane's going out of town Friday or Saturday one. Don't feel sorry. I don't even think we pray for him. He's going to like, you know, turkey hunt. You know what I mean? I feel like he he should pray for us. You know what I mean? That's what he should do for us, us peons that don't get a go. So maybe, maybe, maybe he'll kill something. Maybe he'll get he'll get lucky. All right. Yeah, how did that go? Same thing. <laughs> He's not rubbing that in at all, is he? Like, son, when you get to be in the physical state that I am, then you can handle things better. And I mean, if I was your dad, I would. I would take that cheap shot and say, son, one day you'll be built like this, maybe. Sorry, you got your mom's genetics. <laughs> hey, good news. Great news. Great news. Pain-free-ish. Awesome. Awesome. All right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, say that again. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, my. How old is she? Oh, wow. Yeah, that's rough. Like the, the infusion part could be lifelong as well, or no? Maybe not. All right. In case y'all haven't met, that's her younger daughter. That's Tori. 
Yeah, uh, and a while ago. It's tough. Yeah, can't can't be. No, we got you. We got you on that one for sure. So let's remember Tori as well. It's just hard when they're young. They ain't, ain't supposed to be that way. Anything else before we get rolling? T. Slaughter, can I put you on the on the hook for the opening prayer book? That's correct. We're opening for the stand. Reset during our week so we can keep our focus on you. Speak with all the ones that are sick, Lord, the ones that are traveling, just keep them safe, Lord. Speak to us tonight, help us to learn everything that we can, and help us apply to our lives. Help us to be alive to people, and when they see us, they think of you, Lord. Do so in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. All right, so just real, real quick on Exodus. We're getting people out of Egypt. Got some wanderings that, you know, eventually are going to have to take place. Here we've gotten to the mountain and, and, and conversations are being allowed to be had. And Exodus 24 is a, it's crazy to me that I don't remember a detailed study of this my entire being a Christian like worshiper. And I don't know that I've ever done a specific study of this as a preacher. So I don't know how I miss one of the, like you guys know how much I love those heavenly kind of supernatural encounters. And this one just, jumped all over me and I found it by listening about something else from of course the Bible project guys just randomly stumbled upon this one and like ooh this is what we're going to talk about so let's read I want to do at least 24 one through you know it's only 18 verses let's just do the whole thing can we just do all of 24 all right uh Kevin will you do one through uh, it really starts it ends at 11 do one through 11. Bill, do you mind doing finishing it off? 12 through 18. Exodus 24, 1 through 11, and then 12 through the end. Now he said to Moses, come up to the Lord, you and Aaron, Nadab, Abihu, and 70 of the elders, and worship from afar. Moses alone shall come near the Lord. They shall not come near, nor shall the people go up with him. So Moses came and told the people all the words of the Lord and all the judgments. And all the people answered with one voice and said, All the words which the Lord has said, we will do. And Moses wrote all the words of the Lord, and he rose early in the morning and built an altar at the foot of the mountain and twelve pillars according to the twelve tribes of Israel. Then he sent young men of children of Israel, who offered burnt offerings and sacrificed peace offerings of oxen to the Lord. And Moses took half the blood and put it in basins, and half the blood he sprinkled on the altar. Then he took the book of the covenant and read in the hearing of the people. And they said, All that the Lord has said we will do and be obedient. And Moses took the blood, sprinkled it on the people, and said, This is the blood of the covenant which the Lord has made with you, according to all these words. Then Moses went up, also Aaron, Nadab, and Abihu, and seventy of the elders of Israel, and they saw the God of Israel. And there was under his feet, as it were paved, work of sapphire stone, and it was like the very heavens in its clarity. But on the nobles of the children of Israel, he did not lay his hand. So they saw God, and they ate and drank. Then the Lord said to Moses, Come up to me on the mountain, stay there, and I'll give you the tablets of stone on which I have inscribed the instructions and commands so you can teach the people. So Moses and his assistant Joshua set out, and Moses climbed up the mountain of God. Moses told the elders, Stay here and wait for us until we come back. Aaron and her are here with you. If anyone has a dispute while I am gone, consult with them. Then Moses climbed up the mountain, and the cloud covered it, and the glory of the Lord settled down on Mount Sinai, and the cloud covered it for six days. On the seventh day, the Lord called out, the Lord called to Moses from inside the cloud. Do the Israelites at the foot of the mountain, the glory of the Lord appeared as the summit 
at the summit like a consuming fire. Then Moses disappeared into the cloud as he climbed higher up the mountain. He remained on the mountain 40 days and 40 nights. All right, let's break down some things a little bit. They are invited by God to come up on the mountain. Everybody's around there, the base of the mountain. They've come to the mountain of God. There's a group, all of them are gathered at the bottom. A group is going to be invited to come up. How many is in that group that get to come at least part of the way? Say so you've got Moses, Aaron, some other guys, and then the 70. Just by way of quick review, who are the 70 elders that he's talking about? You remember what how that came into about, how those guys are? What's what you're nodding your head about? Yes. You're going to wear yourself out, appoint some of these other guys to kind of, so that's those guys. So they're kind of being introduced here. Names included strike you as funny at all here? Names that might come up later. Why are you nodding your head, John Henry? Which ones? Nadab and Abihu. That ring, what bells does that ring? Leviticus 10. He knows the book and chapter. What happens to those guys? And here's the thing, and I, this was one of my like kind of little tangents that I ran on, but does it almost make what they do in Leviticus worse, knowing that they got to be part of this? They're not just some of the guys that stay at the bottom. We got the group that's there, and then there's a, a smaller group that gets to come part of the way up, and they're going to get to do something amazing and then one guy, Moses, gets to go all the way up. So you got these three layers. Nadab and Abihu aren't just, they're part of this middle group that are going to do something extraordinary. And then they're the guys later on. So I might have to come back to that, that prepared rabbit. But it just, it makes Leviticus 10 bill that much. Oh, how do you do that when you had this moment? I'll come back to that. So you guys go up on the mountain and worship. Now, I thought it was interesting into verse one. Worship, you've got from afar or from a distance, something like that. Anything else? So coming, but like a healthy, but Moses alone is going to get to come all the way in. Kind of interesting. Um, I love the people's response. When Moses comes and tells them the word of the Lord, what's their response? Man, aren't we starting off so good? We're starting off so good, but we know there's been some stuff that came before this, and there's going to be stuff that came after this, that there's been a little bit of complaining that took place before this, and how's Israel going to do with everything you say we'll do? How are we going to do with that? Even Joshua, you remember, he kind of takes over a successor. Oh, Joshua, only be strong and courageous, just like God told you. And as soon as Joshua dies. So it's a great start, but based on our study of the kings, where are we know Israel. And you know what? We know us. But you at least, hey, I, I feel like God deals with us in the moment of where we are. God's not going to, God right now, even though I believe God knows ultimately where I'm going to end up, right now God's dealing with me where I am. And so right now, I'm going to say the Israelites say, we want to do everything you tell us to do. So I'm going to give them their, even though while he's up there, what happens? <laughs> and this wasn't prepared. This is just another one of those rabbits. But even while he's up on the mountain, what happens? Huh? Man. And Lord, I mean, excuse me, Moses, we were just standing here and it jumped out of the fire. We don't even know, <laughs> you know, so... But hey, they've been in Egypt for a long time. And God's having to reintroduce himself to his people. And he's making a new covenant with them. So we're going to give them some grace. And that's an important thing. That, okay, you've been in captivity long enough. And it's almost like in the book of Exodus, he's reintroducing himself to his people. That are but So we got, all right, so everything you say, we'll do. Moses, get, one, verse four, Moses writes down everything God told him. I think that's interesting. Maybe part of what we're reading. You know what I mean? He gets up early the next morning. He builds an altar, 12 stone pillars. Why 12? 12 tribes representative. And what kind of sacrifice is it there in verse five? Or what kind of offering is it? Yours says peace. 
Anybody got anything different? Offerings, prayer and offerings. The, and nobody has, other than mine, the fellowship offerings to the Lord. So you remember when we studied, and I know, man, this is going way, way back. There's different types of sacrifices. The fellowship or the peace offering, one thing that's interesting about it, other than like sin offerings that are totally consumed, one of the things about the peace offering, you remember what was different about it? You could eat some of it. You could eat some of it. I, I don't know why, but every time I remember when we were reading through that and was going through the details and Kevin goes, man, they're getting really close to doing some good cooking, right? I, I don't know why that that one comment just grabbed a hold of me, but when we were going through that and they got the flour and the this and the oil, like, man, they're, 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 they're shucking and jiving with some stuff there. All right, so we got that there. Moses, you know, he's putting it on the altars. He reads the book of the covenant one more time, verse seven, we're going to do what you said. So then in verse nine, Moses... Aaron, Nadab, and Abihu, and the 70 elders of Israel went up. What do you have leading off in verse 10? It did it to me this afternoon, preparing again, and it's doing it to me now. Moses and Aaron, Nadab, and Abihu, and the 70. Do you remember ever studying this before? Singly, like really diving into this text. I mean, we got songs, and I've preached a ton of times about we're going to see his face in the book of Revelation, right? And man, like you guys know, I love when the angels come and visit and tell stuff and, and see him. You guys know that I love like the glow worm story of Moses, right? You know, that, oh, you can't see me and live, but I'll let you see the backside of my glory. And his face glows so much so that when he comes down, what do the people say? Put a veil on, man. You're messing with us. I can't watch. So you guys know I love it. Here's not just Moses, but Moses and Aaron, the 70, Nadab and Abihu go up on the mountain, and they saw the God of Israel. Now, we're going to break this down because you probably got some questions because I did. What's a question you might? Uh, uh, go ahead. Okay, all right. Okay, okay. To me, it was a big deal. Okay, absolutely. Why? What are we doing with all of this? Yes. So, because we're used to it sprinkling on the altar, but now he's, it's like making it rain on. And I guess what that grabs hold of me is everybody's included. I'm just going to tell you, we're going to eventually get to the Lord's Supper with this. Tell me that's. We're all part of the covenant. And the sprinkling is for, I love that. I, I didn't mean to run past that. I kind of had that, but amen. Bill, did you want to? When they reconfirm the covenant, they do that. That's right. That, and and, and that's, that's, that's more than simple, which man, with where we're going and the veil and all this stuff, I'm just telling like that point, I probably should have. But it, it jives with everything. It jives with everything. So I'm glad that you made, providentially, you made me pull that one out. Verse 8, took the blood, sprinkled it on the people and said, this is the blood of the covenant the Lord has made. Does that not just ring Matthew when he's instituting the Lord's Supper? This is the blood of the new covenant. In my, and it's, all right. So they go up and they see the God of Israel. All right. Now, to me, the text almost kind of makes uh, a big deal out of it. Verse 11, but let's read. 10 says, and they saw the God of Israel under his feet was something like a pavement made. And mine says lapis lazuli. Do you have something different? Please tell me you have something different. Yeah. So here's my question. This is a little bit related. What color is sapphire? Blue. That's going to, I think that's going to have a point. It's going to have a point. So just. Here, mark that one away. Under his feet like a pavement of blue. Is that ringing any bells, Revelation? When he sees him on the throne, what is his throne is surrounded by, what is it? Remember? Of, what's it like? Rocking and rolling, title, or a sea of glass. Similar? A blue pavement like smooth something. As bright blue as the sky, right? Now, verse 11 makes a point to say, 
So they saw God. At least some version, representation, some likeness, some appearance. And verse 11, but God did not raise his hand against these elders of the Israelites. Yep. Yeah. So you got to keep that in mind through the whole thing. This is all at what distance? That's what, yeah, we're not told. It's enough they know who it is and they can see feet. One of the things I read today is, is maybe they didn't see the whole thing. And the reason it emphasized what they saw, because their glimpses didn't get any higher than when they realized what they were looking at. Well, then all I saw was feet <laughs> and what he was standing on. I don't know that that's the case with everybody. I thought that was kind of an interesting, like, so you're, like kind of like Moses and you stumble upon the burning bush. These guys are marching up the hill and maybe you're like, what, is there something, you know, like, what is that? And then the closer you get and then you realize, oh, and so, you know, heads might be dropped. I mean, the people are dropping down at the faces and presence of angels. You know, we're not told about them, but I had a strong suspicion when they realized what they were looking at. What do you think might have been a reaction? <laughs> And that's why, I, that's why I, there's a little credibility of, man, yep, around his feet was blue. <laughs> I didn't want to go any, didn't want to go any higher. <laughs> uh, just, can I just, without just being like overly, um, I don't know, thematic, whatever, can you just get your head wrapped around being a part of this? That's what they get to see. They get to see this, and it makes a point that God doesn't zap them. Because if there was any, oh, there's a discrepancy in the Bible, because it clearly says, when Moses says, God, I want to see your glory. And what, is, what does God have to tell Moses? You can't see me and live, man. It, it, it burned you up. And even he dwells in unapproachable light in the New Testament. So what's our explanation then of what they're seeing here? How would you explain this then? Huh? It, it, it's a glimpse. That's right. Through a veil of some sort. Because we're going to see about, that's the part that Bill read, that there's kind of a veil and a cloud that looked like a fire-like tent. And so they're somewhat seeing through whatever they're able to see, but it says, but God doesn't zap them. One also thing that they throw in there is, verse 1, they're invited. Now, yes, from a distance, but like, what does a distance mean? Like, I think that might just be to highlight, hey, look, only Moses is coming all the way. The rest of you, you're not going to come quite as far. Is that, I mean, is that, I, I don't know what from a, you know, I think you could go overboard with, with from a disc. You guys just don't. So one of the parallels of where we're going, does the tabernacle have a holy place and then a most holy place? And to that first part, who can come into the first part? Can anybody just, can anybody come into the holies? Priest can, but what about that last one? How many guys? There's going to be some symbolism here. So they can come, just like the priest couldn't come all the way into the Holy of Holies, but they could get in the door, the first door, but they couldn't get any farther than the, the veil. By the way, we're going to get this in 25. You know what color the veil? I would always think crimson. And what it, it's blue. It's blue. And I think it's to be representative of this sky that, and anyway, we'll get there. We'll get there. Now, the other thing that just absolutely grabbed a hold of me this afternoon at the end of verse 11, and it, it just almost does not, it doesn't make sense. Like, what? You have a meeting God moment. And how does your version read at the end of verse 11? Ooh, does yours add it that way? Oh, that's, see, that's adding some interpretation, but I think it's definitely shucking and driving exactly the right way. She said, her version says they ate a covenant meal, which is, the, that's adding some color that may not be there, but I think it's absolutely in line with the context of where we started. Why were they doing the sacrifices in the beginning anyway? It's where we're headed. But does that grab you at all? They see God. There is a God seeing, experiencing God, and they know it's him. And the text says, and God makes sure not to invite him. He did invite him up, said they could come part of the way. They let them see only one guy comes all the way, but they see God, and then they eat and drink. Now, how does that, how does that make any sense? Or it make, maybe it makes purpose. It's the covenant. It's the covenant. It, it, it go back to... Um, go back to Adam. And he's leaving. 
um, later. Yep. I had that in my notes. <laughs> um, you know, and his father-in-law is not happy that he's leaving. And, and, and That's right. When we're doing the Lord's Supper, he doesn't say this is the, you know, correct me if I'm wrong, he doesn't say this is the blood of the New Testament. He says this is the blood of the New Covenant. Covenant. Amen. That's a two-way relationship. Amen. So we're, like I said, this is one of the thousand places I wanted to go with this. It's not, like there's just so many, but like feasts were common for covenant making. I had that one in there between Jacob and Laban when they, you know, he's wanting to stay, wanting to stay and trying to leave and finally does leave. And father-in-law's pretty much chasing him down and they make that pact and that treaty and they sit and share a meal. Well, think about what that does. You come and we've got, we got problems. And we're going to try to resolve them, and then we're going to have to sit down and share a meal together. We have to break. What does that do to solidify that? Hey, we really have come. It's it's symbolic, but it's a gesture. It's all over the Old Testament. Um, breaking bread, sharing the meal. Uh, it's not just a business arrangement. It is a new relationship between two people. Uh, I had the one man. There is a neat story. Uh, I may save that. I may save that. It's a neat true story where. A guy accidentally ran over a person's child. And obviously there's hostility. Um, it was an Arabic family. And so basically they set up a meal where they could come together to try to atone for this, whatever. And part, there's all this, there's a lot of cultural things involved about offering of gifts, which the family refuses and whatever. And there's this part of this is where he's apologizing. And, and, and again, they're refusing. They sit down for a ceremonial meal. And when the father of the boy that had been passed took his first drink, it is a demonstration of, I have accepted basically your, I, I forgive you. You know, nobody partakes of the meal until the father of the wounded party took his first sip, which is basically representative of, I accept this. And then this is what he said. The family says to the guy who ran over their 13 year old son, the father, Know, oh my brother, that you are in place of this son of ours who has died. You have a family and a home somewhere else, but know that here is your second home. I about cried a little bit when I ran across that. That's a massive gesture. It was an accident. Nobody plans an accident, but a 13-year-old boy had been killed. And you're just feeling eat up about what you've done and so you were with some help about, hey, this is part of our culture, a way that you could go about taking care of this. And he arranges this meal. And again, he brought these elaborate gifts and did all this part. Again, family refuses. And then the father takes that first drink and then basically says, yes, we lost our son. But because of this agreement, this forgiveness that we're now entering into, you've got a second home right here. You that all over like scripture and God meeting us in this cup that where you went two sided. God wants to enter into this kind of agreement with us. We're going like a thousand places with this about, I don't know how to hold back. I don't know how to like keep you in suspense. I'm just going to jump there. <laughs> I just, I just, I'm just going to give you, I'm going to give you whether it gets over whatever. One of the common statements I've even made, that this text just blows out of the water is that God cannot dwell in the presence of sin. His holy presence cannot. And I get what we're saying. You know what the garden and this encounter and the tabernacle and the sending of Jesus screams? God is setting up shop in the place of sin. It's, I understand we like, and what you were going to talk about in Leviticus, not everybody gets to go into the holy place. So I understand what we're saying, but this, well, God just cannot abide in the presence of sin. He built a house in the middle of it and then invited foot traffic and said, come to me. He invites them up on the mountain. Now, only Moses can go so far because there is a special arrangement. There is a purity. There is an agreement that they've got. But a group gets to come this far. Now you got the group, but they're part of it because they got what you said. Everybody's part of this covenant. God sets up shop right in the middle where all of this is. Man, that grabbed a hold of me. They saw God 
and they eat a meal right there. As, and, and that's, do you think that's a common meal? They, have, they brought a sack lunch. They have in their bologna sandwich and peanut butter and jelly with their crackers and their soda. What is this? That's why I kind of like that your version adds. I mean, it, it says kind of what the picture is. It's, it's a covenant meal. It's This eating is an act of worship of we've done it. And if you're not just brain's not racing here, then man, you're, you need some help. <laughs> it's screaming that. John Henry, what were you going to say? That's right. These people that wake up inside of the car, they sin and plan and, and witness and, and, and save souls inside the car. That's right. And the people are still to this day worshiping the Lord. Amen. Amen. In the world, but not. But so in an effort to not be of the world, let's just stay away from sin. You know that the whole idea of a Pharisee behind the root of that name is separate. They were the separate ones. How did the Pharisees conduct themselves? How does it screen? How does their conduct biblically screen? We're separate from somebody else, everybody else. Can you think of anything? Thank Pharisee and tax collector. What's he say? I'm thankful. I'm not like that sinner over there. And that sinner over there is doing what? God, I'm not even worthy to look at you. In the world, but not of it. Moses. I, I, I don't want to see, was there another hand? I'll make sure I didn't miss. Moses in 15 goes up the mountain. There's this cloud. It, there, even before there's a veil, there's a representative veil of the glory of the Lord. And in verse 17, the glory of the Lord looked like what? He's walking through a wall of fire, smoke cloud. And he's, you know, I don't know how that, I don't know if it opened or if he could just like pass through it like, a, what is the Kevin Costner movie where they walk out into the corn and just kind of like disappear? Field of, dreams. Field of dreams, thank you. What did you say? I said, well, okay, I was like, yeah, I, 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 like, how dare I? I understand. I don't know if it like opened and like, you know, because he could, he could split the Red Sea to walk through. So, you know, I don't know that he, and he gets to enter into that. So here's all the symbology of this before we even get to the pattern that he's going to get. Let me pull up my notes on this. Here's where I think all of this is going. Like, so when you read through Exodus and you get to 25 and beyond, it is very tedious instructions. It's tabernacle blueprints is what it is. Links and measurements, and I want this kind of wood. He even talks about crossbars. I want the crossbar made. I mean, he's literally teaching them how to build exactly what he wants. And you read through that, and it's kind of, unless you're into architecture and you actually can build something, which I can't, it doesn't mean anything to me, right? But he's given his instructions. Now, here's the thing that's kind of lost whatever. And that man, it's grabbing hold to me that all of these instructions God gave them, I want it to look a certain way. And really what it is, it's, it's back to Genesis 1 and 2 of God in the garden. And when he builds the tabernacle and then they duplicate the plans with the temple, it's basically I want a recreation of what I had with man in the beginning. Now, we're going to talk about that there's some buffers in place about why they can't come all the way in and all that stuff. But it's literally God's way of saying I'm setting up shop and I want that again. And then the sending of Jesus is that to like the nth degree. It's, we're, we're going from end of story. How does the book of Revelation, how does scripture opens with a garden? How does it end in Revelation? And what it just didn't dawn on me is that it was driving there the whole time. Now, here's where this symbology gets. So, right, so Eden has three sections. And one of the, almost all of us say garden of Eden, right? That's why I've said it my entire life. You know, it's not scripture. Eden is a location. It's a garden in Eden, right? Eden is a location. There is a garden in there. And then the scripture emphasizes in the 
middle of the garden, there's this tree of life. So you've got kind of an inner sanctum, inner side. It's more circular, kind of looking at it this way. You've got the inner midst of the garden, the midst of the garden, the middle of the garden is this. And that garden is kind of in the middle. And then, so you've got the garden itself. And then you've got that's all of this garden is in the midst of Eden. It's three parts. You've got the outside world and then you've got that. And so then you come to the mountain. They've all come to the mountain. And if you were looking at it from a topographic, where's all of the people gathered at? Bottom of the mountain. But the priests, they get to come. At least part way up, I mean, real close, but not all the way up. You still got to do from a little bit of a distance. And then one guy does what? Moses gets to go all the way in. Tabernacle. The way that they arranged their tribes, how did they do it? They built the tabernacle. How are the tribes arranged? Got it surrounded. Four sides. Four times three, like check me on the math. <laughs> you know it's you know it's needed. They got it surrounded, and even the the, the 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 there was a courtyard. There is a courtyard complex of the tabernacle. There's a courtyard of the temple, and then there's a tent proper. And two thirds of that tent we call the holy place. And inside that holy place was. A table? What did it have on it? Yeah, the showbread is there first. Over in another section, there is a candlestick. How many branches did it have? A seven-branched candle or menorah, that was what they would refer to it as. And so you've got some things, and who can go in there? The priests. And then you have this sky blue veil. That marks off. And then how, who can go in there? How many times? Once a year. One guy. And now he has to go in and he has to cloud that place first. And then he comes in and has to do blood for himself. And then he's got to sprinkle some blood on the altar. And there's some times he's sprinkling that stuff all over everywhere because he's in it. But one guy. See this? And then they build the temple. It's no different. It's no different. So what does all that mean? What am I supposed to do with all this? God comes and sets up shop here. And he asks with specific instructions, you build this to look like what I want it to look like. And the promise is, I will meet you there. Come to me. You can come. Gather. That's a big word. Gather. Gather. Draw nigh. Worship. All of this is coming together. Jesus is referred to, and there's a prophecy in the Old Testament that we're, the, one of the descriptions of the Messiah is we want one like Moses. One like Moses. Moses is the first one to go to heaven, right? He's existing in the presence of God, and he comes out of it, to return to the people and then is allowed to return. He's, he's a foreshadowing of one that can go all the way in and talk to God face to face. He's a foreshadowing of that. I think what you have going on on top of this mountain is heaven and earth coming together. In fact, the way the garden was, the way the garden was, and this is where, man, again, I want to run 8,000 places with this. We have this picture of God's space and our space, right? You got earth space and heaven space. That's kind of the way we, we, we draw the picture. In Genesis 1 and 2, those two spaces were in the same place. Then Genesis 3 happens. And what happens? Now we're separated. One of the promises of Isaiah, one of the promises of Peter, one of the promises of the book of Revelation, what we're looking for is a new heaven and new earth in which righteousness dwells and where now the two separated spaces, God wants to be the same space. 
one of the things that this and the tabernacle of the temple show is that God wants you to approach him a certain way. That's right. Collectively. You've got the tent or the tabernacle or the temple for a reason. It's a place for people, as you said, to gather. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So this notion of unorganized religion yeah. it, it is a fiction. You know, Jesus said, where there's two or three of you gathered together in my name, I'll be there in your midst. He didn't say, for those of you that just are bent on worshiping by yourself. So, do your own it was always a family or a group. It's, it's community, community from Genesis to the end. It's community. So here's where I kind of want to go, and we're kind of out of time. So you got all the symbolism of God basically is wanting to recreate a garden where we can we can be back together with him. But it's it's it, so here's one of the ways it's like, it's like, hooray, God's coming, but it's almost like at the same time, oh man, because we're close to Eden, but tabernacle's still not quite the same, is it? Temple's still not quite the same, is it? We're still not, we got an issue. So what happens around the tabernacle complex and then later the temple complex is day and night there is, every morning and every evening there is, what? A sacrifice. An innocent animal loses its life and that somehow symbolically absorbs your sin so you can enter in and man is allowed to come in. God is setting us up symbolically. I want you to come. I still want you here. I want to set up shop and I'm coming to you. You didn't come to me. Nobody ascended into heaven and brought God down. Paul talks about in Romans. He came to us. But there's still this kind of barrier. So there was a lot of years, thousands of years of yeah, I want you, but before you can get there, there's there's blood that has to be shed. Something has to. I want you back, but there's still this this stain. You know, I need a blameless life offered so you can be considered blameless, so you can get eaten back. But I want it to be. I want this again, but we're not quite there. But we're headed there, and one is coming, like Moses. And now do you go back to what we studied last Wednesday, that when he dies, what happens? That veil rents top to bottom, and he has made us a kingdom of who we can now enter the holy place, and even the three times holy, holy, holiest of holies. We can come boldly. To the throne because of what Jesus did. Now, don't believe that. Because of what he did, we can come boldly to the throne of grace to find help in time of need. It's, it's what he wants. And man, like, so like that meets me here when I'm taking part of this. I'm remember like what I want you to remember when you're eating the Lord's Supper. I want us to be like Moses and these 70 and Nadab and Abihu who went up on the mountain and saw God and they ate. Not a common meal, but a covenant meal. It was an act of worship of we are in his presence. A replica of my house. That's what the tabernacle and temple is. And Hebrews is going to bear this out. Even I think if they're reading this, maybe they don't make that connection. We're supposed to. The book of Hebrews is I'm building a replica of my house and I'm moving in. Now you do still have to approach me as I'm holy. You are approaching the eternal I am. That is a nuclear experience. So you need to come, you know, carefully, but I want traffic. I want you coming. Now, we, we're in a little bit of a morally compromised state that we, we can't get all the way in until Jesus does what he does. And that's why that symbolism of that, that tent, that curtain being removed is such a big deal because now we can come all the way in. and I know it's I know it's a glimpse now but rather can you just picture when we get to have our Moses mountain moment 
And picture it all. So we're all gathered there at the bottom. And I imagine like the first day of heaven. I don't know. I mean, I, I know that it's going to be glorious, but you don't think there's still going to be some reverential like awe. And here we are symbolically. You've not come to this mountain or my Zion, but you've come to. All right. So that's Hebrews. We've come to that Zion and we're all there at the bottom of the mountain together. And we're all part of this group that gets to make our way up and we don't have to stop. None of us. And we all get to go and enter in and see him. And you don't just have to look at his feet, although I imagine that's what a lot of us will be doing at first. But as Revelation says, you will see his face. I've been dying to get to teach this lesson today. <laughs> it's like, can we meet at three and maybe meet till like seven? Because man, I got, I got more that I want to throw on top of this, but I, that's, I have to stop. Start a little late, so I have to stop. Worthwhile study? Never, never. Exodus 24, it's, it's, it, it, it's on my radar now. People seeing God and get, so where we're going to go is now he's given a pattern for this house. And maybe I get it, maybe I won't, but he's going to mention gold and onyx in chapter 25. You know the only other place where you see gold and onyx mixed together at the same time? In the garden. And that's two of the things that he once gathered for this tabernacle. His design and plans is gold and onyx. And the only other place we see those together is what the garden looks like. It's all shucking and driving together. All right, I'll leave you all alone. <laughs> we will cease and desist there. All right, I do have a song I want us to sing, and it's